Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship for Sunday the 28th of June 2020. A quick reminder that there is on the website and on the Facebook page a link to a YouTube playlist. You might want to use that to help you focus on God and perhaps to be in his presence for a little while before you start to worship with us and maybe listen to what he's saying to you through that music. And then you might like to look at the scripture readings from whichever version you find best for you and then join us for the message from the scripture here. So I'll leave that choice up to you. But in the meantime, let's begin in prayer. Let's pray. God, your spirit draws us into your presence, and so we come, drawn by love and upheld by grace. We come to encounter Jesus, our Saviour. We know him as our master, and we know him as our friend. In him we see the Father, whose love sent Jesus to us. Spirit, Son, and Father, we draw close in faith to offer our praise and worship. And we take a few moments to consider just how sorry we are, dear Lord, for the times when we've not behaved as you would like us to behave. For the times when we judge others and find them wanting. For the times when we're sorry that we turn away from your children in their need. For the times when we're sorry that we think we're too busy. For the times when we're sorry that our welcome has been lukewarm. Forgive us. And help us to remember the warmth of your welcome and to be inspired to share that warmth with all people. And help us to know that in asking for forgiveness, you are only too willing to grant it, whether or not we deserve it in our own view. Amen. Let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So the readings for this morning are from the prophet Jeremiah and also from the Gospel of Matthew, the final part of chapter 10, which we've been looking at for a few weeks. So I'm going to read those last few verses from Matthew's Gospel. And breaking with tradition, I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version rather than from the message, because it just feels right in this instance. So reading from Matthew chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 40. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So a quick word about the Jeremiah reading, which um, I've not read out just now, but um, you can read it for yourself. And in Jeremiah chapter 27, we learnt that he had been told by God to make himself a yoke and to put it round his neck and to prophesy to the king of Judah and the other local kings that they should submit themselves to the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, because this was God's will. This was at a time when they were being taken into exile by the Babylonians. But they didn't really want to hear this message. And there was another prophet, Hananiah, who prophesied that the breaking 
of Nebuchadnezzar's yoke would be done by God. And this gives us Jeremiah's response, this particular passage that's focused this week, that he would love for Hananiah to be right, but he doesn't think he will be. But if, however, it does come to pass, nobody will be more pleased than him. So two prophets at the same time, two views of the future, which will prove to be the right one. Well, we only have to look into the Old Testament to see what the answer was. But let's think a moment for where we are now. We find ourselves torn between two views. There's a view that says it will pass and we'll soon get back to normal and we can go back to doing what we, what we did before. And then there's another view that says it will pass, but life will never be the same again. And there are some things we should do differently and some things we should not be restarting. So let's hold that thought and let's look into Matthew's Gospel, to that short passage that I read just there. And it talks about a glass of water and I have a glass of water here. It helps in case I get a coughing fit, but it is a symbol. A cup of water can become a symbol of hospitality or in the UK probably a cup of tea, but nevertheless a cup of cold water if you're hot and tired, and if you've been travelling a long way, can be a very welcome sign. And how many things can you do with this cup of water? Well, you could drink it. Or you could rinse your fingers if they've got sticky. Or you could water a plant. Or you could make a cup of tea. Or you could cook some rice. Or you could wash a bit of floor. And in hot weather, you could go outside and have a socially distanced water fight. All sorts of things you can do with one simple glass of water. A glass of clean water, I would add, because we're very privileged in this country to have access to clean water, not the same the world over. To be hospitable, to be welcoming, is to provide another person with the basics of food and shelter. But it's more than that. For hospitality is an impersonal is not an impersonal exercise. A simple glass of water is an embodied way of saying to another human being that they matter, that we are glad to see them, that we enjoy their company. To be welcoming is not simply a matter of handing over material goods. When we open the doors of our homes, we open our hearts. We show someone that they're of value by being prepared to share something of ourselves with them. We make ourselves vulnerable, thereby creating relationships. And here in Matthew's Gospel, we're told that in welcoming other human beings, we are also welcoming God. Since Pentecost, or Whit Sunday, our Gospel readings have challenged us to think about mission. Having received the Holy Spirit, how do we move into the world to bring about Christ's kingdom? And this actually is our third week in Matthew's 10th chapter. And so far we've been reminded to follow the apostles out into the world, to proclaim the gospel in word and deed, to move into the fields which are already ripe for the harvest, and to pray for more workers. We've been warned that we will not be treated well on our mission and that it will create division, even in our own homes. And as we end our time in this chapter, we learn that our role in the mission is not only as those who are sent out, but as, as those who receive from others. The focus is on welcoming, and Jesus uses the word welcome six times in that brief passage that I just read, which is only three verses. Six times to mention the word welcome. And it paints, points us to the importance of hospitality in furthering Jesus' kingdom. And we're called to consider more deeply what it means to welcome one another. On reviewing these verses, we realise that this welcome can and ought to be practised by us at any time, no matter what circumstances or crises we find ourselves in. We also come to realise that our welcoming does not need to consider, consist of large, 
heroic acts. Any simple, basic acts of kindness that we offer as genuine welcome for one another are all that God requires of us. All we need to do is look around and see who is in need and to try and do something about it. It doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It doesn't have to be big and noticeable. Just a simple glass of water or a cup of tea or even a smile is all it takes. The theology of hospitality perhaps reaches its fullest Christian expression in that final parable in Matthew's Gospel, the one most of us remember as the parable of the sheep and the goats. And in that parable, Jesus reminds us that the way we treat others, who are most vulnerable amongst us, ultimately is representative of our response towards Jesus. And within the parable, Jesus refers to those vulnerable as little ones, or the least. And so we're reminded that righteousness goes far beyond our relationship with God. Whether we're deemed righteous has a great deal to do with how hospitable we are to one another, especially those who are vulnerable amongst us. As people of faith, we're called to promote compassionate welcome, and that motivates us to trust and to be open and to share. And at the same time, we need to exercise caution to avoid manipulating others and seeking personal gain. We might set out with good intentions to form caring relationships. And yet even when left to our own devices, we sometimes fall short of creating and sustaining the kind of relationships that help us to become the people that God has called us to be. Sometimes pride or ego or self-doubt or hopelessness and other sentiments get in the way and keep us from truly connecting with other people. We need God's grace to help us into living into compassionate welcome with one another and extending genuine hospitality. Like all small acts of devotion, tenderness and forgiveness that go largely unnoticed, but strengthen the relationships that are mo most important to us, the life of faith is also made up of many small gestures. Gestures like making a phone call to ask how a friend or stranger is doing, dropping off groceries for the elderly or the ill, reaching out to the lonely and most vulnerable amongst us. According to Jesus, there's no small gesture. It's a cup of cold water is the smallest of gifts, a gift that almost anyone can give. But a cup of cold water is precious to a person who is really thirsty. And in some instances, it can be the gift of life itself. Jesus doesn't specify the nature of the reward for those who help little ones. But the kingdom of God, sorry, but in the kingdom of God, the smallest service brings with it eternal reward for the giver as well as the receiver. There is a story about the poet and playwright Oscar Wilde who was sent to prison in 1895 and it was the ultimate humiliation for him. In his day he was a real celebrity but all that evaporated once he was convicted. Whenever the prison authorities moved him in public, he was spat at and jeered. On one occasion, when the crowd was particularly hostile, a friend of Wilde appeared and made a simple gesture of friendship and respect that silenced the crowd. And what was that simple gesture? As Wilde passed by, handcuffed and looking at the ground, the man simply raised his hat to him the smallest of good deeds. And later Wilde wrote, the memory of that lowly silent act of love has unsealed for me all the, wall, all the wells of pity and made the desert blossom like a rose and brought me out of the bitterness of lonely exile into harmony with the wounded, broken and great heart of the world. 
and it's in that spirit that the clap for carers on Thursdays at eight o'clock took hold across the UK in those early weeks of lockdown. It didn't do anything practical, but it demonstrated the respect and the gratitude for the work that the NHS workers and all other key workers were doing in putting themselves in the front line, <clears throat> in taking those risks in order to give us the rest of us, that better chance of avoiding that virus that was sweeping the world. <clears throat> and it highlights the total disregard and disrespect of those who have crowded onto beaches and into raves and other illegal gatherings, thus risking a second wave of infection. The smallest of good deeds a little thing done in love. The cup of cold water is a symbol of that. <clears throat> it doesn't take much to be hospitable and welcoming and accepting of other people. A cup of cold water replicated in a host of other simple, small deeds. And Jesus tells us that every single one of these small deeds is important, <clears throat> even eternally significant. It doesn't take much. Every one of us can achieve these small things and every one of us can make that difference. We can find God in the smallest of good deeds. The opposite of a welcoming atmosphere is a hostile environment. And the government's policy of creating a hostile environment for illegal immigrants proved disastrous for our society. For illegal immigrants proved that they were valuable people. They were the ones keeping some aspects of our economy going. But it also led to things like the Windrush scandal, of which we are truly disgusted. It all creates fear, encourages suspicion, perpetual perpetuates divisions and demonises vulnerable human beings. All in the hope that people would voluntarily return to their own country. It cultivated not welcome, but rejection. And by shutting ourselves off from other human beings, we risk shutting ourselves off from God. In this time of coronavirus, hospitality, just like everything else, can't quite be what it was before. We haven't been able to invite people into our homes or into our churches. We can't give them a hug. But that needn't mean that we can't be welcoming. The challenge is to find inventive ways of telling people that they matter, of sharing the basics of life, of giving reassurance and comfort and opening our hearts something as simple as a picture in a window to make people smile as they pass by. For each welcoming gesture, in those we welcome God. The roles of those who welcome and those who are welcomed are interchangeable. We're all called to be Christ to each other. Jesus sends us to share the good news, to alleviate human suffering, to meet real needs, to work miracles of love and healing through acts of kindness, cups of water. We're called to remember that we too are to go as people willing to receive those same acts of kindness. When we welcome one another, we discover the reward that comes from deep hospitality found in God's welcome of us. Whoever gives you even a cup of water will most certainly not lose their reward. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name and in the name of peace for the war-torn countries of the world, for countries where violence is rife, 
for communities where tensions run high. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of sorrow for the people of Reading as we remember James Furlong, Joe Ritchie Bennett and David Walls, for those who tried to save them, for those who grieve for them. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of justice for the marginalised people of the world for those who are discriminated against, for those who are trafficked. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of compassion for the animals of the world, for those that are hunted, those that are exploited, those that are endangered. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of gratitude for those who stand up for the oppressed, for those who kneel down for the victimised, for those who speak out for the silenced. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of love for children and young people, for those who are vulnerable, for those with special needs, for those who are carers, for their parents and siblings. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and in the name of hope, for economic challenges to be overcome, for opportunities to be embraced for changes to be long-lasting. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name and in the name of faith for your church throughout the world, for those entrusted with leadership, for congregations reaching out into their communities, for one another to live as we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name and in the name of thankfulness for businesses and venues preparing to open again, for families preparing to meet up again, for friends preparing to socialise again. And we pray for all in government as they continue to monitor and measure the levels of infection around the UK. Lord, hear our prayer, for you are our strength and our inspiration, and in you we trust. Amen. So before we close, I'd just like to mention the fact that next week, July the 5th, we have down on our church calendar as the church anniversary, a time when we'd have a special service and we'd celebrate the history of the church and its forward-looking plans. This year, we can't meet in the church. And so we've decided we're going to have a flower festival but not with real flowers, because that will be a waste in a building that isn't open. So what we're asking people to do is to draw and colour pictures of flowers. One flower, bunch of flowers, a whole design of flowers. It can have words on, words that are important to you, words that you want to pray for, words that you want to give thanks for even a scripture reading if you're so motivated. And the plan is, if we can get them all to me by the end of the week, by Friday, I will laminate them and we'll stick them on the front fence of the church on Sunday morning so that the church will be full of flowers 
on the outside at least, <clears throat> and passers-by can see and celebrate the gratitude for having a Christian presence in this part of Failsworth. So if you want to take part and you haven't got the details because you're not in receipt of the newsletter, which will be going out this weekend, then please feel free to request the details and I will give you them. The more the merrier, the more colourful the better. It can be any age. You can get your grandchildren to do it. You can get your aunties and uncles to do it. You can do it yourself. You can pull them down off the internet and print them off. You can do what you like. The important thing is we have a colourful display, a sense of thankfulness and gratitude for all that God has done for us through Macedonia Church over the years. So thanks for being with us today. It's been a joy and a privilege to speak to you again. And if it's the first time, I hope there'll be another. So go in the name of Jesus, to follow the way of Jesus, to love with the love of Jesus, and to be sustained by the peace of Jesus. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Stay safe till we meet again. God bless.